Let's now explore each movement. In his review of the work in 1880, Julius Spengel wrote, and I quote, the first march-like movement returns us to the time of the true serenades. It gives us the scenery of the late Rococo, end quote. The march does indeed offer an oral image of the stateliness of castle life in the late 18th century. through its characteristic dotted rhythms and strings of parallel thirds. For a Prague audience in the late 1870s, these traits, a plethora of dotted rhythms and parallel thirds, would have meant folk, and perhaps even Czech folk. Such musical codings existed in the 19th century. Let's listen to the opening of this passage. This is one of those instances where the third horn takes on a bass function. A true minuet would have a melodic pitch on the downbeat. Here's what the opening would sound like if the movement really was a minuet, with the clarinets beginning their melodic phrases on downbeats. The minuet was a well-known 18th century dance that was incorporated into instrumental works as a third movement. It was replaced by the waltz on the dance floor and by the scherzo in multi-movement <clears throat> instrumental works. By choosing the title minuet, Dvorak is paying homage to the 18th century genre, though he subverts it by not having the melody begin on a downbeat. So if Dvorak avoids the minuet, what does he do? As mentioned above, he creates versions of two Czech folk dances. The A section is a sosedska, meaning neighborly in Czech, and is a couple's dance in triple meter. It began as a country dance, but soon came into the urban dance repertory. Older forms were related to the minuet and often served as ceremonial wedding dances. The dance could be done at various tempos, but consistently exuded grace and elegance. We've heard one stylized example already from Dvorak's Slavonic dances. Here's a couple dancing a sosedska. tempo and a pronounced use of hemiola. We've also heard one of Dvorak's created furies earlier, one of his Slavonic dances. Here's a dance version. Notice the hand gestures that emphasize either two or three beat groupings.
Dvorak's Fury X. He calls the second movement a furiant, though the defining hemiola is absent, and the movement instead resembles a fast-paced waltz. Dvorak hints at the distinguishing cross rhythms of the furiant in the first part of the movement, where gentle hemiola and the bassoon and horn foreshadow the prominence of the metric device later in the trio. The hemiola returns at the end of the movement as well. Here's the furiant's foreshadowing. of the Moravian duets, the excerpt of which we heard earlier, that helped make him famous. Note the horn writing in this opening passage. Dvorak wanted the timbre of three horns to fill out triads. He employs this sonority and texture to delineate form in the movement. and recurring motif of an ascending lead followed by a descending second provides a sense of operatic drama. The upward striving and struggle give way to calm and resolution at the return of the opening texture. The adventurous harmonic language suggests an emulation of Liszt's efforts in this regard. The opening motive is also present, providing a sense of organic unity. the motif emphasizes triads at its end. As an example of thematic transformation, again, think list, when this passage appears as a proper theme later, those thirds are compressed into seconds. This is a created folk tune in the spirit of a polka. The opening passage 
passage, though, actually consists of two parts presented sequentially. We've heard the first, now we'll hear both. <coughs> is arpeggiated and contrapuntal. It is notably distinctive from the first and also becomes prominent later in the movement. Because the second idea is so different from the first, it seems inevitable that Dvorak would find creative ways to exploit this contrast. He does not disappoint. Indeed, Dvorak displays his contrapuntal dexterity by presenting the two segments simultaneously. Early in the coda, the oboes and clarinets play A, the first part. While the bassoons, horns, and strings play B, the second part. two parts combined. Later in the coda, Dvorak embellishes this process. Now, the oboes and first and second horns play the A material before passing it off to the bassoons and strings. The second statement is slightly altered through a reversal of the last two notes. Likewise, in this example of invertible counterpoint that surely would have pleased Brahms, the bassoon and strings play the B material before passing it up to the first oboe and second clarinet. adds to the texture so as not to leave just two treble instruments outlining a triad. And now the passage as written. The retransition, the passage that leads to the return of the opening material, is replete with possibilities. Beethoven focuses energy here, while Brahms often diffuses it. Here's Dvorak. <laughs> to do just that. Dvorak did this in his serenade for strings, and Brahms also did this in his third symphony. Furthermore, the practice was widespread in France. So how did people react to the work? Brahms praised the serenade to violinist Joseph Joachim in May 1879, writing, and I quote, a more lovely, refreshing impression of real, rich, and charming, creative talent you can't easily have. I think it must be a real pleasure for the wind players." End quote. He also praised it to his publisher, Simrock, and also to his friend, the surgeon and amateur musician, Theodor Birot. And in this duality of Czechness and Germanness, where does the work fall? How Czech is it? How un-Czech is it? 
Even within the German music realm, the so-called War of the Romantics divided musical opinion. This was the debate between followers of Brahms on one hand and those of Liszt and Wagner on the other. Dvorak found himself caught in the middle. He admired Liszt, but was friends with Brahms. In the serenade, he demonstrates a musical resolution. Listian principles of thematic transformation and harmonic language are present, as are Brahmsian features, such as contrapuntal practices and an overall absolute music aesthetic. Nowhere is Czech mentioned in either the serenade's title or in the titles of any of its movements. But Czech elements are certainly present in the two Czech dances that constitute the second movement, a Suseska and a Furiant. Furthermore, an overt folk atmosphere is exerted in the middle section of the first movement and during the entire fourth movement. Dvorak, as a Czech composer in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, could be seen as perhaps being on the fringe of German greatness. To be national in this instance could indeed be a liability. Gustav Mahler wrote in 1907, at the concert, I also heard some pieces by Sibelius, the Finnish national composer who they make a great fuss about, not only here, but elsewhere in the musical world. One of the pieces was just ordinary kitsch, spiced with certain Nordic orchestral touches, like a kind of national sauce. They are the same everywhere, these national geniuses." End quote. <laughs> so how would Dvorak and his serenade fit into Mahler's comment on these national geniuses and their sauces? <laughs> Living in a time when national identity and cosmopolitanism were significant forces in the musical realm, Dvorak, in his serenade, demonstrates a clever way to address these issues. He wrote a serenade, not a Germanic suite. He looked back to the 18th century Czech Rococo, where harmony groups were popular, and created a work with immediate appeal. Dvorak spoke in a voice with both Czech and German inflections, and likewise bridged the national and the cosmopolitan, creating a work that, as we'll hear momentarily, exudes noble simplicity and elegant grandeur. Thank you.